Thank you very much, Ellen, for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks also to the... It's, it's all there. If something disappears, just let me know. Um, yeah, I was just uh, thanking you as a uh, for this uh, invitation, nice invitation to be here to present my work. Uh, so, in fact, in my group, uh, we are uh, actually doing, uh, since uh, already quite a few years, uh, work related uh, to solid liquid interfaces, and in particular, uh, with focus on what is the structure and dynamics of the solid liquid interfaces uh, at the atomistic resolution. So, we want to know, at least from the simulation, how really the interface looks like at the atomic scale. And uh, well, I guess that uh, I don't have to motivate this here. And in fact, uh, um, so I think we can save time on the next couple of slides where I wanted to give a bit of motivation, but this is redundant mm -hmm. here. Because I suppose that everyone in the audience is convinced that, uh, well, it's, it's interesting to investigate interfaces for the fact that they're ubiquitous uh, in, uh, in all the systems and the, the fact that the properties at the interface, of course, are different from those in the bulk. And um, they're also uh, timely in the sense that uh, since a few years, uh, there's been an enormous uh, um, growing the capabilities of experiments in particular of addressing selectively interfaces. And then, I mean, just put you some some familiar pictures here, um, which refers to, for example, the FM experiments, which are, can now be performed at the solid liquid interfaces, and for example, some uh, vibrational spectroscopy, which can selectively address the interfaces. So uh, from the perspective of the molecular dynamic simulation, the nanoscales that can now be investigated so efficiently and so precisely in the experiments is also the natural scala um, where the phenomenon occurs. And that is also what we can um, address with the molecular dynamics simulation. And they can provide a complementary uh, view with respect to the experiments um, where the microscopic details of the specific interaction which occurs at the solid liquid interface uh, occurs and then with i mean the joint uh, um, collaboration of the experimentalist and uh, and the simulation people can certainly help to gain uh, this uh, microscopic view of the interfaces so what we are uh, doing from the methodological point of view is uh, atomistic description, which uh, is based on the, what is called ab initio molecular dynamics, when uh, atoms uh, are uh, moving according to the forces calculated, uh, uh, including the full electronic structure, or what is called force field molecular dynamics, where empirical uh, uh, parameters are developed uh, to describe uh, the motion. So in a picture, so what the um, initial molecular dynamics is, is a com combination of uh, one side, the classical um, approach, which is uh, the Newton approach and uh, the Schrodinger approach. So we are kind of uh, solving uh, um, classical emotion of the, of the atoms uh, subject to the um, forces that are calculated from the electronic structure. So I mean, stealing a, a picture, <laughs> which I, I have, this is a combination of the two worlds that comes into the initial molecular dynamics. So now um, what I will present today is a couple of uh, um, uh, application which I've selected. Uh, on one side, as a first application, I will present you water interfaces. And in particular, um, some work that we have been doing uh, uh, to characterize them from with the vibrational uh, um, spectroscopy. Uh, in particular, this would be the computational work that has been done in, uh, in my group in collaboration in a uh, couple of examples also with, with Ellen. And um, in the second part, I will also, I also talk to show you something about uh, uh, different liquid, so um, sometimes we have to go beyond water because there are also interesting interfaces uh, uh, which involves uh, uh, other liquids. And an example is these ionic liquids. And I will uh, present you some work that we have been doing on 
what happens to this metal ionic liquid interface under different condition and, um, and in particular uh, also out of uh, equilibrium condition in flow and uh, under applied protection. So let's start uh, with uh, the water interfaces. So this is a picture that is familiar to you. So uh, I mentioned that from the experimental point of view, it's possible with the SFG, which is this uh, uh, selective uh, vibrational uh, spectroscopy of interfaces uh, to access information on the interfacial layers uh, at the interface with the solid. Um, so the, the question is, uh, what can simulation and how can simulation help um, also to provide the molecular pictures which is behind the spectra that are recorded in fact um, these complicated experiments can tell us a lot of information about the molecular details but of course there are information which uh, only in a combined approach with the simulation can can be really uh, revealed so in particular, uh, together with, uh, with my postdoc, Remika Thib, a few years back, we have been working on uh, calculation of SFG spectra from atomistic simulation, in particular from ab and uh, molecular dynamics. So in fact, uh, uh, the calculation of the spectra is something that has been already done in the community for quite a few years. And one of the pioneer of, of this uh, approach was uh, Morita, for example. And um, well, it was uh, rather uh, soon figured out that it's possible to use simulation and in particular the calculation of the um, dipole moment and polarizability in order to calculate the response function that is measured in the experiments. And uh, this is the chi 2 signal. Um, and in the initial uh, uh, work, uh, for example, uh, by Morita and many others that have followed, mostly uh, classical molecular dynamics force field based molecular dynamics was used. So when we started to work on this at the beginning already together with uh, Marie-Pierre Guijot, um, we wanted to extend this to ab initio dynamics. And the idea is that uh, in the ab initio, we don't have to parameterize the, the, the parameters for, for, the, for the dynamics. So, so we have naturally the electronic structure there. And so we include the aspect like uh, uh, polarization, electronic polarization that uh, uh, characterize interfaces, uh, which uh, don't have to then be described with, with uh, let's say, some some parameters. Uh, the point is that, uh, well, ab initio like dynamics is expensive, and calculate uh, such a correlation function is, of course, something that needs to uh, reach convergence and has to be sampled over a very long time, which are uh, most of the time beyond what is accessible directly with the ab initio molecular dynamics. So one of the things that we have been working on with, with Remy was try to speed up things a bit. And the idea was to re-express this uh, uh, polarization and this type of moment in terms of local quantities of molecular dipole moment and polarizability and decompose them in the product of, uh, you see, the velocities and the change of the dipole moment or the polarizability with respect to the local, some local coordinates which characterize the normal modes. So the idea of this approach is to reduce the calculation of this uh, response function here to something simple where we can substitute essentially this uh, polarizability and dipole moment of the old systems in a correlation function which only requires the velocity. What is the advantage is that in a molecular dynamic simulation, the velocity are a natural product in the sense that they do not require extra cost to be calculated. They are automatically an output of, of our simulation. And therefore, this would reduce uh, considerably the, the cost associated with the calculation of the SFG, permitting also to calculate the signal uh, for, let's say, longer uh, on, on a relatively uh, longer time scale and for different systems. So I will uh, I'll show you an example of a system where we have been actually working uh, uh, together with, uh, with Ellen, the calcium fluoride water interfaces. When we started the project, we wanted to find a system where we could really work together um, 
with experiments and the simulation so that was uh, not so complicated enough as, or from from the computational point of view to require special treatment of the electronic structure for example and that was also something that was accessible uh, from from the experiments like uh, this is the in fact the window that is actually some this um, often just uh, the basis for uh, the real material that you want to really analyze. Well, uh, although it's kind of a simple system, the interesting things that there were still some open questions, and in particular, one of the questions was what happens at low pH, and uh, why, for example, there's a very high uh, signal that is recorded at the, at the interfaces, and uh, so. Previous uh, experiments uh, performed uh, on the, such a system have put down the ideas that this was due to the charges and in particularly charge defects that, uh, let's see if I can use the pointer here, just disappeared. Uh, well, you see now this, this plus uh, stands uh, for the place where uh, typically on a neutral surface, um, um, a fluoride atoms is sitting at low pH, the, the topmost atoms diffuse, dissolve, and then positive charges is left on the surfaces, which can polarize um, quite strongly the water. This was a one possibility. In fact, the, there were also some other AFM experiments from the group of Fukuga, of Fuku, Fukuma, uh, who instead put out the idea that. Uh, if in fact what happens at low pH is that there are hydrogens or better protons sitting at the interface, which then could certainly influence the structure. So we wanted to verify this hypothesis and to see what, what could be uh, a model which explains the experiments. So we have been simulating different models with different uh, uh, values of uh, charge concentration. So for example, here in this figure, you can see um, the, the simulated system, and um, this is uh, 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 this is uh, with different uh, first we, we did a different charge of defects here for plus two plus and one plus and we have calculated the, uh, the spectra, and then also we consider the system here where there are proton defects at the interface and in fact the the proton likes to be at the interface and diffuse. Um, quite close to the to the surface, parallel to that, and we also calculate the spectra. So, I mean, now if you look at now the, the for example the the red curve, this is the imaginary part for the system with the charge two plus. And now if you go to the system with the red dashed, which is almost not so visible on this on this scale, this is the same charge, but in terms of proton defects. So, meaning that uh, for the same value of two plus as a charge, the charge can come from either defect on the surface or protons which diffuse at the interface and they produce a very, very different spectra. Um, I think which is, this is quite uh, a, a, an interesting effect and this is, to, is due essentially to the fact that in the case of localized charges, they can order the water, um, while if the proton diffuse, uh, the order, the local order is continuously changed and on average, there's much less ordered water that then that is uh, instead found in the other case. And um, in fact, uh, um, uh, this, this, uh, this shows, uh, I mean, we also compared uh, um, this, uh, these results with experiments. We found uh, the best agreement with experiment is in fact uh, for localized charges. Um, and this is just an example showing how localized and delocalized charges can have a very different impact on, uh, on the spectra and how simulation in this case can help to, to rationalize what happens. Um, there's another example that I wanted to show you. This is uh, the, the platinum water interfaces. So this is more like a prediction for, uh, for spectra than uh, actually, uh, because in fact, uh, spect the, the SFG spectra haven't been uh, um, yet reported for, uh, for such an interface in the stretching uh, uh, range. 
And uh, the reason this I also figure out discussing with Ellen is that uh, uh, experimentally it's very difficult to access this region because there is a, an resonant signal which dominates this part of the spectrum. For, from, the experiment, from the experimental point of view, so it is for very complicated. And from the simulation, what we have tried uh, to, to, to do is uh, to simulate this uh, uh, platinum water interface and um, to predict what would be the SFG spectra uh, at, uh, the, at, at this interface. So this we have done at, uh, at different uh, level of uh, polarization. This is work uh, in collaboration with the group of uh, Tilde Kushinotta at the Imperial and uh, using uh, essentially the charge uh, unbalanced approach. So we can vary the amount of charge that is uh, uh, on the metal. This can be done basically varying the concentration of the ions in the solution. When we put uh, more negative, uh, let's say, uh, ions in the, in the solution, we can get uh, the surface positively charged and the other way around. When we put more uh, uh, positive ions in the solution, we can get negative charge uh, on the metal. In this way, we were able to have different, uh, three different values of the potential and to look out the water structure uh, change at the, at the interface. And this is, uh, this is here. So, uh, well, first of all, yes, I mean, in this, this figure here, you, look, uh, you can look at the density, water density for the different values of the applied potential. And you see that there is a, an important change. In particular, when we move from the negative value, so minus 0 0.5, this is uh, with respect to the standard hydrogen electrode, and we increase uh, the potential up to positive value, we see that we also, increase the amount of water that is sitting at the interface. Not only the density change, I mean, in the first layer, there's a certain a change in the density. You see this peak here, but also the orientation of water is changing and this is affecting mostly the second layer. So the picture is somehow the following. So as the, po the, the, the potential becomes more positive, more water crowds the interface, but they, they maintain a, so an orientation with the oxygen pointing to the metal. And uh, while uh, the, the more uh, the positive is the potential, more there is a reorientation of this second layer. And this is reflected in the real and the imaginary part of the spectrum, in particular in the first panel here, you see the imaginary part here is the, the real part, and then you can see that this is, uh, this is really uh, in the, the, this is the stretching uh, region of the spectrum. You can see um, this, uh, this first layer characterized by a larger signal as the number of water molecules increase. And then this is the signal for, for the second layer, which is uh, showing this change in the orientation. Okay, so this is, uh, this is some work that we did uh, on the static SFG spectra. Uh, but of course, uh, it's also interesting to, to look at another aspect of this uh, interface specific uh, vibrational spectroscopy, and in particular, uh, the multidimensional spectroscopy. Uh, in principle, one could uh, calculate uh, the corresponding uh, response function. And in fact, uh, uh, this has even been done for a, a few uh, rare selected examples, but it's extremely expensive. And as I said, we already had issue converging uh, the static signal. Uh, therefore, we decided to, to have another approach, which although it's not calculating exactly the experimental quantity, not the response function, it permits us to access few information, in particular the relaxation time scale that is associated to the multidimensional vibration spectroscopy. And then this will also provide information on the hydrogen bond network uh, um, around the, 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 the surface and uh, in particular, the approach that I'm going to describe also permit us to understand what is the dissipation mechanism and how this happens um, on, uh, in particular, the, in the, the bulk and the interface. So this is the work of uh, Dominika Lesnigi, who has been also postdoc in my group. Uh, so the idea 
to, to uh, access uh, vibration, uh, um, vibrational relaxation, energy relaxation is the following. So we produce an excitation, exciting uh, locally a single water molecule. We could do also, I mean, we could also do more, more water molecules at the same time. In fact, all the sample is also possible. But the idea is that we want to be selective so that we have a, a given position where we put the extra energy so that we can follow where the energy is going. So how we do put this extra energy, assigning extra velocity according to the local normal modes. Why this permit us to basically we also select at the same time the frequency. So for example, in the case of water, if we are assigning extra velocity uh, according to the, the stretching, for example, the, this can be the symmetric stretching, then automatically we will have uh, the frequency excitation in the stretching region. So this spectrum that you see is the, the results of many of these processes, excitation processes. Um, on different water molecules and at different times. Huh? So this is like uh, uh, this single molecule experiment that we do, but repeated, let's say, a thousand times, so that we have a good statistics. And this is the excitation spectrum centered at the frequency that we want. In particular, this is the stretching. So now we can track uh, how the energy is moving out of the excited water molecules and now it's transferred uh, to the other molecules, and this is done using uh, some descriptors based on uh, the velocity density of state. And then uh, the idea is that, uh, for example, we can follow in this way how the energy leaves the excited modes. This is this red curve here. And this is uh, the original stretching mode that has been excited and how other modes are populated. For example, the, the bending modes, this, uh, this is the, this black line here, not, not that much in this case. The first stretching mode, which is this blue line and the second relationship. So what happens, what we see is that the energy which comes out of this, let's say central water is then transferred to the first solvation shell. In fact, the, the, this, you see that this gain energy and then eventually relax and with some delay is also transferred to the second solvation shell. So most of the transfer is occurring through this stretching, stretching coupling. And in a specific case, not so much, it's coupled to the bending. Um, I mean, apart from getting the, the, the mechanism out, uh, an interesting thing is also that we can uh, analyze this, uh, uh, this stretching. And in particular, yes, maybe I should mention that uh, uh, we can calculate the time scale of, of this uh, energy transfer. And in fact, this is uh, in quite, uh, quite good agreement with the um, bulk data. This, this was done as a first test on the bulk. And then uh, you, you can see that here we can also plot the relaxation time as a function of, uh, uh, for example, the excitation frequency. So this will be um, the relaxation time for red shifted, more, uh, let's say, uh, 3200 up to more blue shifted region. And then we see that there is a, this nice trend uh, in fact, that shows that the relaxation is much faster when we have uh, in, in the more uh, red shifted region and then it's slower in the blue, which makes sense uh, because, uh, I mean, we have just seen that this is uh, connected to the hydrogen bond. And then in the, the red shift uh, part of the stretching, it's associated to very strong hydrogen bonds, which makes the transfer faster. while. Uh, on the other end, if the hydrogen bond network is weaker, then the transfer is, is less uh, effective. And um, this heterogeneity is something that was already pointed out also uh, in the experiment, in particular, uh, also this uh, from the, the group of uh, um, Misha Born, I think, and, and Johannes Hunger in, in, this, in this work. And um, they also found uh, uh, this uh, strong heterogeneity. In fact, uh, here we have reported uh, uh, the, the results uh, from the simulation and the experiments. 
like in red and in black, and then you see that there is a very good agreement. Uh, so, I mean, this this very same trend. So the, rot, the, the, the red one are the simulation and the black are the, the experiments from this paper. Um, one can also look at other modes. It is not, of course, limited to the, the stretching. We can look at the bending, and then the bending is actually relaxing faster. And um, uh, but I would like to to show you a little bit of, of, about the interfaces, which is uh, in fact our uh, initial subject. So this this bulk we have done as more as a, as a test. Um, so in fact, what happens at the interfaces? is that uh, uh, we also here see that uh, um, the, the relaxation is uh, dependent on where uh, we, are, we are sitting. So already from the experimental point of view, it was pointed out, uh, so for example, in this uh, um, experiment of Tara, but I mean, others have also contributed the surface to surfaces that uh, in fact, slow relaxation is also possible in interfaces associated with the free OH. And uh, we have calculated uh, together with uh, Navaz, uh, who has been postdoc in, in my group as well, the, um, this uh, relaxation in, in the slab and separating the, the bulk and the surface of, let's say, three angstrom thickness or an even um, uh, tiner uh, uh, surface of just two angstrom. And then, I mean, as we move from the bulk toward the surface, we see this uh, slow down. So we can break it down, in fact, uh, also in terms of frequencies. Now we can separate the relaxation times as function of the excited frequencies. And we see that when we are in the frequency range, uh, in a lower frequency range of the stretching region, the transfer is faster, it's this blue, then you go to this intermediate uh, region and you find uh, something uh, uh, like also intermediate in terms of the relaxation. And if you move uh, towards uh, these uh, ends of, of our spectrum, where, uh, for example, the free OH also belongs, you see this slowdown of, of the relaxation. So again, it's possible really to put uh, this one-to-one -one correspondence of the uh, um, relaxation time scale with the, with the hydrogen bond network. So this is, a, a, again, another way of looking in terms of donor accept, maybe we don't have really to go to the details. Now, Let's go back for a moment to our charged interface. So calcium fluoride that we have seen at the beginning. So uh, what is happening there? So in the, in the group of Ellen, they also have been performing uh, experiments with uh, the 2D SFG on this, this charged interfaces. And, um, and in particular, uh, we have been doing the simulation using this technique that I've just shown off. You know, it, it, exciting uh, the water molecules and looking where the energy is going. In particular here, for example, we can concentrate uh, our work on just this uh, interfacial region, this gray region here, and uh, try to do a similar plot uh, as, uh, as you have seen before for bulk water, but now this is for the calcium fluoride. And apparently, I mean, again, here, same color coding, so the red simulation are our data and the, the black are the experiments from the group of Ellen. And then we see a kind of similar nostril situation to bulk water. So that our first uh, interpretation was this is like uh, interfacial water here be behaving more or less uh, as, uh, as the bulk. I mean, at first sight, this could have been impression. In fact, uh, this is not quite uh, the case. So what we have been, uh, what we figure out is that uh, what happens here is that the water at the interface is very strongly oriented, as we already figure out from the from the static spectra. And uh, on average, they don't have a full solvation shell. Those are the interface; they just have an alpha solvation shell. But uh, this specific water, which forms this interfacial layer, are uh, on average subject to a much stronger hydrogen bond network, which make the transfer faster. So even with the alpha of the solvation shell, so basically they are able to dissipate this excess vibrational energy in the same time scale. 
So this explains why also the interfacial water, which in principle is less hydrogen bonded on average, only out of the solvation shell, it's capable though to transfer the energy in a quite, uh, in a quite fast way. So just to um, wrap up this uh, first part, before moving to the to the ionic liquid, so um, I wanted to to give you an idea of how it's possible to combine um, phase sensitive SFG and ab initio molecular dynamics in order to elucidate details of the interfaces, in particular the water interfaces here, and uh, how it's possible to provide a molecular assignment of the different features which are in the spectra, and there's a an interesting difference between localized and delocalized charges, which show up very clearly in this uh, example of the calcium fluoride interfaces. And uh, this, this type of uh, non-equilibrium simulation of producing local excitation, we believe it's a, it's a kind of nice tool in order to investigate the local hydrogen bonds and can certainly permit to make a link with experiments of the multidimensional vibrational spectroscopy and in a joint effort that would permit to analyze the, the energy transfer at the interface. So we have seen in the calcium fluoride, the special case of uh, this interfacial water, which is so fast with uh, just an alpha observation shell. So in the remaining time, I would like to instead move to an example that is uh, beyond the water. So it's ionic liquid uh, at the interface. Uh, and this study was, uh, was motivated uh, by some experiments which came out a few years back, showing a peculiar uh, behavior of ionic liquid in confinement in the AFM, in particular, when they were approaching with the FM tip, the ionic liquid, at some point, there was an abrupt change in the impedance at certain distance showing a solid-like response. So something like the confinement between the tip and the substrate was kind of making freeze the, the ionic liquid. And the, the distance at which this was occurring was interestingly dependent on the material of the substrate. So the fact that uh, you would have uh, a conducting or a, you know, a metallic or non-metallic substrate. So it was put forward the idea that probably the behavior of the ionic liquid and the freezing could have been associated to the development of image charges at the interfaces. So um, the idea was, okay, well, Let's try to, to understand what we can learn from the simulation. And this is, in fact, the, the work of, uh, I mean, the, in fact, these are, they were the experiments of the Diderik Bouquet. We were in the time uh, in the same IEN network, and, uh, and Samuel was just starting his PhD. So we, we started with him to look at uh, what's going on in the, in the simulation. And uh, so this is the system that we have been uh, investigating. So two slabs of metal, and then in between we have uh, this uh, very uh, large layer of uh, quite thick layer of ionic liquid. So this is the same ionic liquid that is used in the experiments here, BIMIM BF4. And uh, in order to describe the metal polarization, so this effect of the image charges, so we use a polarizable model for the gold that we developed uh, together with, um, with Andrew Kynes and uh, the previous student and my group, um, Isidro. Um, and um, yeah, so this, this, this model is capable of uh, basically uh, reproducing the following effect. So it's very simple. So when you have a metal and you come with a, a net charge, so the, the, the charge is attracted by the surface, uh, as you would see a, a, an image, a specular charge. No? And this, this effect uh, cannot be easily described in an Nenda Jones model, for example, or in the typical non polarizable model that is used in the simulation. Instead, if you use this uh, polarization, you are able to really reproduce this effect, and we have uh, um, a complete uh, quantitative agreement also with higher level calculation. So, Okay, so that, I mean, with, this, uh, uh, with these models in mind, we started investigating what happens at the interfaces, uh, including or excluding the polarization. We, in the simulation, we can switch them on and off. 
And uh, so we started asking ourselves a few questions. So the first uh, is uh, how far is the order extending? So actually, in fact, we see that the order is not very much extended as was also previously seen for, for, uh, for other uh, confined ionic liquid, uh, only a few nanometers. Um, and also this is, uh, this is maybe a, a, the, zo the zoom in this first area shows also that there's not a big effect of the polarization. I mean, as a, just as a color code, uh, the two colors corresponds to the different components, cations, uh, no, sorry, the, uh, the other way around. So cations and ions are distinguished by solid and dashed um, line while uh, the colors, the black corresponds to the non-polarizable force field and the uh, red to the polarizable force field. And we didn't see many, a big difference. In fact, also not in the electric field that is produced uh, at the interface and then the, the, the interfacial potential. So we also went to calculate some thermodynamic properties. So we could calculate what is the interfacial free energy. So uh, the work of addition, so how would cost to separate the solid and the liquid. So this can be measured and um, can be measured selectively for uh, the Lennard-Jones component, the non-polarizable part and the polarizable part. But essentially we only see that this, uh, this polarization only accounts for the 2% of the total, which is uh, not that much. And, um, but the interesting thing is that these thermodynamic properties can be related to a change uh, um, induced by the confinement on the freezing temperature. And we can then relate, uh, um, for example, we, we can calculate what is the change in the in the freezing temperature for the for this ionic liquid just for a two nanometers confinement. For example, this is this uh, this value that we get here. This is uh, um, using the Gibson Gibbs Thomson equation can be just obtained from this interfacial free energy essentially. So we see that this is a sizable change, but the fact that we include the polarization is not affecting things too much. So it's more the confinement. Uh, then the, the really the metal nature of the substrate and that is determining this, uh, this larger change. Maybe an interesting aspect to notice is that uh, although we have seen that the structuring, so this, uh, this change in the densities was only happening in uh, the first two nanometers, the dynamical properties are changed on the long range and it takes uh, well up to more than 10 nanometers from the surface in order to recover the bulk properties in terms of the diffusion. And this is, uh, this is just the diffusion as, as function of uh, distance from, from the gold. Um, now, um, so, uh, yeah, we, we think we start a little bit later. Do we have a few? Yeah, okay. So in this, the, the next few minutes, maybe I can show also another couple of interesting behavior of this ionic liquid in confinement. And so one thing is the fact that uh, um, when you apply the flow, so what happens? So this is, this is the typical situation. We are in an experiment so where we, we come with the, the tip of the FM and the, the, the liquid that is here is squeezed out. Um, so we can kind of simulate this, uh, what happens? with the um, shear flow simulation. And um, what we have noticed is that for this ionic liquid, that there is a certain linear regime in the central part of the slab, but the, the, the liquid is not behaving linearly any longer when you come to the interface where the sort of uh, what we call frozen layer. So something that is behaving in a very glassy, um, glassy way different from the from the ideal behavior this i think is something interesting going on this can be related uh, to properties uh, like uh, load and friction coefficient and the fact that this uh, this glassy layer develops at the interface uh, it also what makes also the ionic liquid a good lubricant because it's resistant to the to the to the squeezing forces um Maybe one last thing is that, uh, um, again, in this type of experiments, it's also possible to apply a bias. And so we also try to, to look at what happens uh, in terms of uh, properties of the liquid uh, 
uh, confined liquid as we change the applied potential. So this, this can be varied in the experiment and this can be also varied in the simulation. And um, in particular, uh, um, varying the bias, we can calculate what is the differential capacitance. So uh, the change in the charge as function of the applied potential. And I mean, meaning uh, uh, charge in this, uh, in this layer, interfacial layer here. This is, uh, this is something that uh, I reported here. And I found it interesting uh, that uh, in these properties, in the interfacial capacitance, you see that the polarization matters. So you recall the color coding, red polarizable, black non-polarizable is the same that I used before. And you see how the polarization is announcing the capacitance, both at negative and positive potential. Um, so one thing that we can learn from the simulation is also uh, the charging mechanism. So what happens as we, um, in fact, increase the applied bias with positive or negative potential? So this can be uh, understood, for example, using some, some descriptors, some parameters, so which are... Uh, uh, telling us uh, um, how the system is, is responding. So, for example, when I have the positive charge on the electrode, uh, what happens to the ions? Do the ions uh, um, compensate the local charge? Or, for example, the, there could be two mechanisms. One is the ions exchange, and the, the other one is the co-ion adsorption. So the ions exchange is that uh, when you have, uh, let's say, a positive potential on your electrode, then uh, positive ions leave their place and let negative ions to come in and compensate the charge. While uh, co-ion desorption, it's, it's that when the positive, just the positive leave, so that there is more space for the others. So they can, uh, there are two different mecha mechanisms. And what we see is that uh, the mechanism is a bit different depending on uh, the positive and the negative potential. Essentially, can be summarized in this uh, in this cartoon here. So this is uh, this is the first layer. Imagine that this uh, positive and negative uh, uh, ions of the ionic liquids uh, are sitting more or less ordered here. Then we have the positive ions, so for the, the, sorry, the positive charge on the electrode, and then the counter ions tends to absorb. So more negative ions crowd the interface. For the negative, the situation is different. It seems to be easier for the system to compensate the charge in the fact that the co-ions disorder and leave the, leave the system. So there is also an, a, a further mechanism that is a reorientation so the, the large cations, which typically lay flat in the case of a neutral surface, when there is an increasing negative charge, they, they start to change their orientation. And instead of laying flat, they turn so that they can more closely pass. And this is also something that, that we see in here for the, the, this uh, imidazole cations that, that tilt. Okay, I think it's uh, time is up, so I would like just to show the conclusion. Um, so regarding this the second part, I think it's possible to, to really get with this simulation an idea of the structure and the dynamical properties. In terms of structure, we haven't seen a very extended structuring, but from the dynamical point of view, the interface is pretty large and way larger than what would appear from, from just the structural point of view. So our conclusion is that the image charges do not play a big role on the structure and dynamical properties, although in the, we have seen them having an important effect in the capacitance. So in the under shear flow, the ionic liquid develop a nonlinear behavior at the interface with this frozen or glassy layer, as we want to call it, at the interface, which is a couple of nanometers thick. And then uh, this already said that the, yeah, the, the, there is an effect on the capacitance. And then I would like to conclude putting up the acknowledgement. I think I've mentioned most of the people, no, certainly all the people that have been doing most of the, the work in the, in the project, but just yeah, just to be sure not to have forgotten every, everyone as so I put it there. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention.